to dead man talking. Tonight's story is another fantastic thrill ride from the fantastic mind of Edward Ed Smith. As ever, please do let us know what you thought down below in the comments box. Please do like and share. It really does help build the channel and our community further. And why not hashtag Team Fear? And so, with that aside, let's get into tonight's story entitled The Land of the Oklahoma River Ape Case of Missing Urbanite. Let's get straight into that. Notes from author. The following is based off of real events. The casino footage from the Concho Casino, also known as the Lucky Star Casino of 2002, the Oklahoma Chicken Man in the late 60s, and the Stinchcomb Wildlife Refuge Area Sightings Database Entries and YouTube Radio Shows. This story is fictional. Those three events are listed and others that are listed in sightings databases are real. Thank you to the licenses, viewers, and subscribers, and to DMT for us to fear. Let's begin. The North Canadian River in Oklahoma is a murky, muddy water river stained by the Oklahoma red dirt, which we are famously known for. Most people associate this part of the country, the Dust Bowl days of the bygone era. The truth is, it's green and productive land, that is not anything like the days of the Grapes of Wrath, but now it is a very welcoming place to live, raise kids, and we'll have fun. The North Canadian River flows from the northwest to the southwest, as it courses through farmland, cattle pastures, wooded sanctuaries, marshes, and yes, even swamps along the way. Into major metropolitan urban scapes that rise up out of the prairies. There is something different about the North Canadian that, well, is a bit of mystery and with a touch of unknown. The area that I talked about, a swath of land that is some of the most lush woodlands in the area, is the river bottoms and tributaries that feed the river. The swath I speak of is inside a boundary that extends from El Reno, Oklahoma, east 15 and a half miles, to the Stitchcomb Wildlife Refuge area, and from there, 17 and a half miles to the northwest to the Lucky Star Casino, and then onto the west northwest to the town of Greenfield, and closing a boundary 29.9 miles to the southeast back to El Reno, where it forms a quadrilateral. Contained in this boundary is the habitat of the river ape. These dark, dense corridors can allow for anyone or anything to travel without being noticed, unless you happen to be looking for it. Or perhaps it crosses your path and what happens when that crossing takes place is, well, quandary in itself. The River Ape, akin to the Sasquatch or Bigfoot, unlike with his woodland cousins or the Wood Ape or the Kiamichis, the River Ape is shy. It doesn't call or howl, or it does, but very seldom. But when pushed by natural stresses, much like any wild animal, its hunger can be a dangerous thing to humans. Stitchcomb Wildlife Refuge Area is a wondrous area of woodland, marshes and swamps in a relatively close proximity to the urban sprawl of the Oklahoma City Metroplex. The contrast of urban and rural clash in a visually stunning vista of life in the recent decades of urban growth a thousand acres of wilderness set alongside the concrete of our daily lives. This is where our story begins. Rose Penningsworth, age 33, daughter of a very successful petroleum mogul, grew up in a privileged family able to acquire all the convenience of life that money can provide, her education at Vassar, and then on to the University of Tulsa, provided for her the cultural, social, and above all important connections for her future life. But all that was nothing compared to her desire to just enjoy nature. 
she really wanted to be a park ranger or an environmental biologist for the Corps of Engineers. But her father wouldn't approve of her wants and desires to reach for her dreams. He wanted her to ascend to the heights of the board of directors of his company and one day be the chief executive officer. It was not for her, but she didn't have the heart to tell him. She was absolutely not interested in the path in life he wanted for her. She wanted to be enveloped by nature and the wild lands that she knew were waiting for her. Rose was also tired of her father trying to get her married to several of the rising executives, which he was grooming for the top slots of the corporation. None of them were anything like she envisioned herself marrying. She went out with several of the applicants, at least that's how she felt when they were at dinner. She always found a way to excuse herself to get out of the evening early. No, it was maddening. One day, when she was running through the Stinchcombe Wildlife Refuge area, cross-country trails on the perimeter of the refuge boundary, she saw a number of trucks parked along the boundary dirt road. It was a drill rig and several pumper trucks and a petroleum drilling mud tank trucks. And she only knew what they were because of her father force-feeding her the brochures of the equipment. And she didn't like what they were doing there, but she understood the what and the why. As she was jogging, she caught sight of one of the most stunning men she'd ever laid her eyes on. Well, he was about six foot and was built like an Oklahoma farm boy, but with a suntan skin, the chiseled features carved out by ass-busting work on the rigs, and that dark hair with the afternoon stubble on his face. Well, he was defiantly a sight to behold. And the fact that he was shirtless under the sun of the Oklahoma summer sky, a sweat glistened down his abdomen, and with the covered arms tied around his waist and his drilling boots covered in mud, he stood there coiling up a pressure hose, and that the boss man wanted squared away before they pulled out. She ran over to him and said that she didn't always ask for strangers' numbers, but she would really like to have dinner with him. And she said she hoped he would say yes. He smiled and took out a pen and a small pad from his back pocket, and as he was writing it, she was even more mesmerised by the Greek god of the oaky smile. He handed it to her in an almost bashful manner, and she said thank you and ran on. As she was running away, he was shaking his head in an unbelievable way. As she got further away, she could hear his co-workers teasing him about the whole event. When she got home, she took the piece of paper out of her pocket and read it. And it said, Ronnie Turner, 918 0909. Any time with a smiley face scribbled on the bottom of the note. She showered and set about laying out her clothes for the next day. As she was at lunch the following day, the memory of Ronnie's face and, well, everything was just driving her crazy. She went to dial the phone number and hung up. After the first few attempts, she said, Oh, this is crazy. The next thing she knew, she was leaving a message on his voicemail. She hung up and said, uh, he'll never call back. Two hours later, she was getting dressed for a date that she thought would never ever happen. And Ronnie is coming to pick her up in 15 minutes. And there was a knock on the front door and she opened it and there he was. A great pair of cowboy boots, wrangler jeans and a cinch button up short sleeve shirt that he filled out right proper. Well, of course, she already knew what was under that shirt and to top it off, he had an Oklahoma State University baseball cap. What she saw, she liked, and Duddy would not at all, under any circumstances. Ronnie asked if she was ready and offered her his right arm. And she grabbed her evening purse and his right arm and off into the night they went. She stumbled and almost fell off the side step of his truck, but he was right there to catch her. He closed the door and he took her to Cattleman's Steakhouse over on South Agnew Avenue in Oakey proper. After a comfortable meal, he then offered to buy her a drink and she asked what was he having and he said he was having iced tea and that he doesn't drink alcohol. And when he was driving a lady around on a date, she smiled and then talked about the evening. And he said he doesn't like the roughneck life but the money is just too good. It would be hard to find another job that was paying $125 an hour. And she said that she understood her dad was in the oil business. 
and when he asked what the name of the business was, he told her that the contract they were on right now is for the same company. They both laughed, and before too long, they were friends, and she learned that he was 28 and that he had two kids with a woman. And that would not let him see them, but he pays child support, and it's hard not to think of them. But that's life. They debated what to do after dinner. And he said, do you like to dance? And she said she didn't have much experience at it, but she would like to try. Well, let's go to Cowboys. It's over South Meridian Avenue. And she said, okay. This was what she was craving for a long time. An actual date on the town with a man, not an application. When they arrived, the bar was only about half full and it was an enjoyable, not packed feeling. And she asked if she could have a white wine and he left her at the table and came back with a wine glass and a bottle of water. They sat for a while and a slow song by Blake Shelton started playing and he said, I think this is our song tonight. What's this song? Came here to forget, he said. They began dancing in the embrace of emotion. And she thought, okay, his hands are going to start traveling, but his hands stayed in their proper place. And this made her feel like she never felt before. And what a surprise, a roughneck and a gentleman, a rare find in these parts. The night waned on, and before too long, they were on her doorstep. And he said he had a real good time and that he hoped they could do it again soon. He kissed her passionately, and he turned and walked down the sidewalk. As he was almost to the curb, she said, How about you stay tonight? And he turned and looked a little shocked. And then she said, Yeah, I think we deserve this. He smiled and shook his head and walked back up the sidewalk to her. And said, At least I wore clean underwear. And they laughed and disappeared into the doorway. Next day, she awoke to the silhouette of a naked man talking on a cell phone in the window of a second floor balcony. Oh, she might have been scared, but it was the man she was with all night. He hung up and walked back to the bed, where he slowly crawled into the bed and she said, calling your other girlfriends. And he laughed and said, I was calling my boss telling him I'm going to be late this morning. Had a doctor's appointment? Oh, did he bite? She asked. No, he was at the bar last night. I'm busted but he'll cover me. She rolled up on top of him and said, well, I guess we better make it worth it to you for missing $120 an hour. As she slowly slid down his chest and he closed his eyes and said, now this is how you ditch work. It was about 9am when she was getting dressed for her day. Ronnie had left about 40 minutes ago and she ran down the stairs and right out the door. Her day was perfect. She came back from work about 6pm and decided to go for a run. And she got dressed and headed out the door. It was a warm afternoon. And she was running down the trail that she had run a thousand times before. She thought of Ronnie with every step and she couldn't get him out of her mind. Every thought started with what was in his pants. Damn girl, get a grip, she thought. Before she knew it, she had taken a wrong turn off the normal path around the perimeter of the refuge and she was in the inner woodlands next to the marsh and was about three quarters of a mile into the interior of the park and this trail was unfamiliar and it was overgrown and cluttered with debris the odor of sewage wafted across the direction she was running and she thought she heard a grunt from the right side of the path and she turned to the sound and she thought she saw a form of a man standing way back in the undergrowth it was just then she felt the fear of being watched and the snap of a limb of a tree from behind her. It was at that moment she felt nauseated, but she decided that she would run in the same direction that she had come from. And when she thought, she could hear movements on both sides of the trail. She increased her pace and was almost back to the perimeter trail, and she heard a noise of something to her right. She turned her head to the noise, and she was hit by a mass and was large and moving at speed and Rose's world went black. Ronnie was just getting off his shift at 8pm and was covered in mud from a 12-hour shift of drilling. 
His son rose from text and had no replies, even when he sent her a picture of her new best friend. And he said, Damn girl, even a dead will reply to that. Another call and another voicemail. All right, I see what I was. Just another buck for the night, he thought to himself. I'm going over there tonight. Ronnie went home and got cleaned up in record time. I headed over to Rose's, and when he got there, he went to the door and knocked. The door opened, and a man was standing there, and said he was Detective Ross, and asked who he was. Ronnie explained, and the detective asked if he would ask him some questions. The detective and a uniformed officer took Ronnie to a guest bedroom, where there they asked him some questions for about two hours. The detective asked him to stand and then informed him that he was going to be detained until his story was checked out. As they were leading Ronnie handcuffed out of the room and into the entry of the house, another man said, Is that the guy who hurt my daughter? He took several steps towards Ronnie and got a punch on Ronnie's face. The detective restrained the older man and told the uniform officer to get Ronnie out of there. And Ronnie couldn't believe what was happening as he was booked into jail on suspicion of murder and the judge gave him no bail. The next day at about 6pm after exhaustive interviews and repeating the same story at least 11 times they released Ronnie. He called his boss and explained what had happened and his boss assured him that he would keep his job but he would have to write him up after six months if it fell off his file. The next morning, Ronnie showed up for work at 5.30am and everything was good until 9am when his boss called him into the office and said that he was going to have to lay him off because Rosie's dad was going to pull his contract and kick the drill crew off the job if he didn't get Ronnie off the payroll. Uh, Ronnie was pissed, felt betrayed, because he and the boss had been co-workers for over six years. Ronnie went back to his house and grabbed a bottle of Jack Daniels and started to get absolutely shit-faced. Uh, meanwhile, the Oklahoma County Sheriff's Department and the Oklahoma Highway Patrol and several surrounding municipalities sent their search and rescue teams to search the refuge. The first pass turned up nothing, but when the dogs were brought in, the dogs tracked her scent into the interior of the refuge. But when they got into the thickest parts of the interior, they straight out refused to go any further. As a matter of fact, they turned around crying and whimpering and peeing on themselves. The handlers were absolutely stumped by their display of fear. The search teams went on into the bush and found one of her running shoes still tied the left shoe. I looked very dirty, which was not like her to have such dirty shoes. The investigators would later find out. And the search in the area of the thickest intensified teams crossed and crisscrossed the area, and nothing else was found. They searched the river and downstream for about a mile and nothing. The case was ruled a missing person's case, and the media coverage died off after about two weeks. Her father posted in a $250,000 reward. Even with the reward and three private investigators, nothing more was found. And the police interviewed Ronnie eight more times, each time arresting him and bringing him down to the station and interviewing him for hours. The bills were mounting up and the police were constantly on Ronnie and the private investigators were asking any and every one that knew Ronnie every question under the sun about his life and his ex-girlfriends and about his kids. And it didn't help when their mother started in with the lies about him abusing them and her, digging up every piece of dirt or impropriety that they could whether it was true or not. The pressure pushed Ronnie to drink more and he almost got a driving under the influence charge against him. But his baby brother knew the officer from the deployment to Afghanistan and let his little brother have custody of him. Ronnie found an oil field service job about four months after the layoff, and for about one third the money, and he had to drive a tanker truck into rough country. But it was a job, and his child support took a huge chunk. 
He was now living in an efficiency apartment and driving an old beat-up Chevy truck because his other truck was repossessed. He was on call to service a sludge tank in a remote part of the Canadian county, just north of the town of El Reno, just north of the city's lagoons, east on Highway 81. While he was on the site, he just finished with the tank and he needed to check the discharge hose that was located in a small channel that led to the North Canadian River. As he was walking east down to the discharge channel, he got a creepy feeling like something was watching him. It's a feeling that he had gotten before at other production sites in the area. He finished his check and was about to return to his truck. There was times like this he wished he didn't pawn his pistol. He'd seen something that looked orange on the side of the discharge channel, almost at the edge of the river bank. The feeling of being watched seemed to creep in closer. He pulled his knife and proceeded to the edge of the river and the discharge channel. As he got closer to the object, he saw that it was a shoe. A bright orange shoe, now dirty, but still pretty bright. He leaned out to pick up the shoe, and a tangle of bones and leathery flesh fell out of the shoe. He yelled and dropped the shoe and backed away from the shoe, and the decomposed foot. And then something caught his eye, he approached the foot, and there, on the foot, was a butterfly tattoo. Under his breath he said, Oh my God, Rose! He went to go get the foot, and then he stopped, just short of the foot, and he thought for a moment. Man, if I take this foot in, they're going to think I did it. They're almost ready to hang me. Fuck, what do I do? Think, damn it, Think! I can't chance it. I'm just barely hanging on as it is. He looked out across the river and almost thought he saw something step back into the woodline. And the creepy feeling increased yet again. And he said to himself in a low voice, Fuck this, I'm out of here. And he returned to the truck, got in and almost started the engine. He sat there for almost ten minutes and then decided to go back and get the foot. Oh, I gotta do it for Rose, as he remembered how caring she was and how he really thought that he and she might have a chance. He walked back to the foot's location and the feeling of being watched was still with him. And when he got back to the location, the foot in the shoe was gone. Oh, he looked everywhere, it was just right there, and then he saw it. There it was, a footprint it was about 15 inches long, 6 inches wide, and it seemed to be flat-footed and have 5 toes. And then he realized that the water was still filling the print. It was just here, he said to himself. Fear grabbed him, and he could feel something was close, something big. He could hear it breathing, and whatever it was, was behind him. He was over 100 yards away from his truck, and he thought, okay, take a couple of breaths and run. And he bolted, and Ronnie ran as fast as he could, and he could hear footsteps behind him, moving quick. He was almost to his truck when something stepped out from behind the truck, and it was tall, about seven, maybe eight feet tall. It was covered with long, straggly hair, arms were long past its knees, he slid like a baseball player past the gas tank hanging under his truck and scrambled under the truck to the other side. He jumped up on the passenger side, stepped and opened the door, and then the beast that was chasing him appeared on the passenger side. Ronnie slammed the door and locked it, and the beast began pounding on the door. He jumped into the driver's seat and started the engine and threw it into gear. As, out of his peripheral vision on the driver's side window, he saw the thing looking at him. Why, he could see his breath on the pane of glass. He stomped on the accelerator and the wheel spun in the gravel and the beast on the driver's side fell off the step. He spun the truck in a big U-turn in a field adjacent to the dirt road, nearly missing a pile of discarded broken concrete. He tore off down the dirt road to the pavement asphalt road where he could turn right onto the East Jones Road and back to the truck yard in Yukon. 
finally, he pulled into the truck yard of Bellow's oil field services and sat there for about 30 minutes as he processed what had happened. Those things wanted to eat me just like they ate rolls, he said to himself. He went to the library and began researching similar things on the internet and then he stumbled upon a North Canadian river project and they define these monsters as river apes. Ronnie decided to make a report about his incident and when it came to the part where they asked for a name, he was going to put his name on the report but then made a decision to file the report anonymously. He just couldn't bring himself to put his name on it. He drove his beat-up old Chevy truck out to where he first met Rose and reminisced how good it felt to have someone care about him again. Looking at the wood line, I know what happened out there, girl. I'm going to make him pay, he said to himself. As he reached behind his seat and pulled out a rifle, an old AR-15, he'd spent the last of his cash that he'd saved on it, and a Ruger 45 pistol he had just bought from a pawn shop with his credit card. He made sure that he had several loaded magazines for both, and he strapped on his baby brother's bayonet that he got from him when he returned back from Afghanistan and strapped it to his left leg and took a breath and stepped off towards the wood line. All right, let's dance. As Ronnie walked into the wood line, his cell phone laying on the center console of his truck went off. The caller identification said, Rig Boss. The text of the voicemail came through about three minutes later and it read, Hey Ron Dog, we're on a different contract now. I need you, Ronnie. Come see me next Monday. I'll get you back on. How does 145 an hour sound? Hit me back, bro. Four days later. The rig boss was sitting in his office shack and was watching the 6 a.m. news. KFOR was reporting that the search for a missing hiker was being called off because no further leads or evidence of wrongdoing was found. Ronnie Wayne Turner will now be listed as officially missing. The rig boss looked up at the television, set his coffee cup down and stared at the screen in disbelief. Wow, 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 wow. Another one. Wow. Absolutely awesome stuff there, Ed, once again. A magical tapestry that you uh, weave together in our minds here. Thank you ever so much, Ed, for your dedication, your support, and your friendship on this channel. It really does mean the world to me, buddy. And I do enjoy your writing so, so much. So fresh, so different. And uh, always pushing the boundaries. I like it. Guys and girls, as ever, you know the drill. Please do let us know what you thought down below in the comments box. Please do like and share. It really does help build the channel and our community further. And why not hashtag Team Fear. Of course, don't forget I have a exclusive members only area. Available to join now. The link to that's in every description box below the video. Over in the members area, I'm going to be starting to fill this up over the next week quite heavily. I've already got four, I think, exclusive videos and members only. And there's been a few early access, 48 hours early access uh, videos that have gone up and then passed on to the regular subscriber only. And there's been a few uh, early access 20... And there's been a few early access 48 hour early access videos um, that I know myself and a fucking hell just say what you got to say fam <laughs>